Welcome back to Switched to Linux. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about Fedora Silver Blue. So this is one of the immutable operating systems. Now, we've talked in the past about a few different immutable operating systems. One of those was Vanilla OS. We looked at this uh, based on Ubuntu, of course. Now I believe they said they're going to roll that over to being based on uh, either Debian or Debian SID. I forget exactly. I, I did see an update notification on Vanilla OS. Just can't remember exactly which direction they were going. The other one we looked at was Nix OS, which was a completely independent distribution. Now, what these immutable systems mean is that the various components, the all of the core operating system is in basically one container. The packages are managed by something like Flatpak or inside of other containers. And there's a lot of system modifications to really prevent you from doing a lot of uh, different changes inside the system itself, which will help to make a more stable system. In other words, once it's up and running stably, it should work pretty universally across everything once it's up. So the idea behind Silverblue is that one container can then be a duplicate across entire workstations, across entire companies, and you can make a simple modification to one, deploy it across everywhere. These are really neat, really good strategies. They also carry with it a little bit of benefit for the security end of things and that it's harder to modify the system files, the, the core files. You can't e easily get in there and make some of the various adjustments. Now, one of the things I mentioned about NixOS, which in my opinion is too immutable, if you want to do a simple host file redirect, you need to do a configuration change on a core file and then redeploy your system, which kind of is a pain for someone like me who always works between different development servers and things having to jump different uh, DNS routes. Now, that being said, Fedora Silverblue does a really good job of balancing the immutability, having a lot of the different tools, but also being easy enough to make those changes. So I could get in there with uh, and just do a quick modification to the host file. And well, as long as my browser is not using DNS over HTTPS, then it's going to work for me just fine. So we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Let's look at the documentation briefly, and then we will go ahead and have a brief look at what the system is going to look like. So over here, the Fedora Silverblue user's guide has the uh, information. Now, it is a variant of Fedora Workstation. It looks, feels, and behaves like a regular desktop operating system, and I completely concur. If you did not tell me this is Silverblue, I would not really know it unless I try to do something like install an application with DNF or do a lot of really weird underbelly things. Now, the downside, of course, is all the applications are shipped by flat package by default uh, with a few minor exceptions here and there, which means the system is going to take a little bit more disk space and in some instances could possibly run a little bit slower. But with how ubiquitous Flatpak has become and how many applications are shipping with that, you don't really compromise a lot of the software that is available. So that certainly is a little bit neat. Of course, you can always use the toolbox and containerize anything that you do need on DNF or other uh, standard ways. Now, it's not as good as security of a VM, but it does give you the option to run something. And I'll show you what I did with that just to show you a, an example of what it can do, even though there's infinitely better ways of doing it than what I did. Now, what they say down here, their immutable design is intended to make it more stable, less prone to bugs, and easier to test and develop. Which, by the way, that toolbox I mentioned, you can run that toolbox as a different version of Fedora than is what is on your core, making it a very fascinating thing to to do to test different applications across different Fedora versions if you want to do that. So the core technologies have other helpful features. OS updates are fast and there's no waiting around for them to install. Just reboot as normal to start using the next version with Fedora Silverblue. It is also possible to roll back to the previous version of the operating system if something goes wrong. Now they have three primary things. The OS installation, um, the OS installation is exactly the same. There's no different settings. You're installing it the same way. You go into the basic OEM install, you reboot it. All that kind of stuff, we're not 
going to go through that again. I've done that several times here. If you're new to the channel, you can have a look at several of the other Fedora videos I've done, and the install is not changed. Now, installing apps and software and OS upgrades and rollbacks does get a little bit different. Installing software, three primary means. The first is flat packs. This is the primary way you are going to install GUI apps on your system. You're going to install it by utilizing the flat packs. Now, I did find that it appears as though FlatHub, like flat pack is set up, but FlatHub is not installed. I actually had to download the uh, an install package for FlatHub to get it to work and then. Uh, my software store started to work. So a little odd. Um, of course, the main Fedora work start, workstation, you don't have to do that step, but on this I did. The second way is the toolbox, used primarily for command line applications, development, debugging tools, but also has some support for graphic app, graphical apps, although a little bit, um, uh, it's it was not really designed for that. And then package layering. Most Fedora packages can be installed on the system with the help of package layering by default the system operates in a pure image mode, but package layering is useful for drivers, etc. So while most of it is an image, there is some ability that you can do otherwise. So here's Flatpak, and this is what I had to do is uh, go over to the flatpak.org setup slash Fedora. I had to download this repository file and run this file, and that is what actually set up my software store to be able to work and then you could install applications from there. Here they talk a little bit about package layering. Uh, so a good example of packages to be layered would be Fish, Sway, uh, Libvirt. Um, so RPM packages provided by Fedora can be installed on Silverblue utilizing this, uh, this methodology. So if you're dealing with RPMs, um, Canon print drivers, for example, Brother print drivers, they do ship these as RPMs. This is how you can do that. So here is how you can install packages. Uh, is you use the o RPM dash OS tree install and use the package name, same exact package name as you're getting through DNF. You can replace packages and things like that. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at the toolbox real quickly while we're installing software. So why use toolbox? It makes it easier to have containerized environments on the immutable systems. Uh, it keeps the host OS clean. So all those different dependencies you're installing, instead of scattering them throughout the system like what you would usually happen, it keeps the OS clean and puts all those dependencies inside of the toolbox instead. You can easily remove the toolbox and then all of that stuff comes crashing on down. This is one of the things that made Linux, after a while, even your constant rolling systems like an Arch, would make it more sense sometimes to just wipe it out from scratch and import your data. Because you're getting these dependencies are all in there and some of them are changing and you remove some software, the dependencies may not be removed. You get a big cluttered system. This is what Toolbox is hoping to achieve, keeping all of the core OS separate from all of the different dependencies inside of this toolbox. You gain access to different versions, so you can set your toolbox to be a different version of Fedora. The one I'm working with is 37, but you can go back to previous versions or even onto the next experimental ones if you want to. Uh, safe places to experiment. You can throw the thing away, although it's not as safe as doing it on a virtual box. We'll go talk about how to do that in a bit. And then uh, updating it. So RPM OS tree upgrade, and then you can also check it. This will check for new updates, download, install them. Uh, alternatively, to check for updates without downloading them, this is what you're going to do is the check. All right. Now, upgrading between major versions. You can't go, you can't skip two major versions. So make sure you're, you're uh, upgrading these regularly or uh, do whatever you need to do. And then there are rollbacks. So just like you can do with Nix OS where you can uh, redo the configuration and then you can run it, uh, run the new configuration, but don't roll to it the next time. You have a command for that. Or if you want to uh, roll it completely, you have a command for that.
With that, though, let's go ahead and have a brief look at Silver Blue just so we can get a chance to see what this guy looks like. So you can see here that we have a couple different builds. So as you're running it, these are basically going to represent different um, uh just different containers. So the second one here is the the most current one. If I want to roll back to a previous one, you can roll back to that. So changes are going to be your basic updates, or in this case, I install the tool chain or a toolbox, and then I install the um, I, I I install the software package the way you shouldn't install a software package just to see if it works. Uh, hashtag it does. All right, so here we get our login screen. We'll go ahead and enter that just. Once again, just with Fedora as typical, Wayland is the default. You have GNOME Classic and uh, Org and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get logged in with a super secret password. That's definitely not one, two, three. Now we get landed over here, and as we look into the system, uh, it's going to uh, grab the software catalog. Hopefully, it's going to work. Uh, we're going to let that go for just a moment. Of course, this is just the basic applications installed. By default, not a whole lot. So here's updates are available. And I think it might actually do some updates um, automatically. Uh, so application updates, these require additional permissions. Um, so you can restart and update the system here or not. Here's what is already installed. And then if you look at oh, nope, don't uninstall. If you look at all of these guys here, you'll notice that. All of these are installed as flat packs, and you can actually confirm that just by going into your terminal and do your flat pack list. So you can see that all the different applications that we have are actually installed as flat packs. All right. Uh, yeah, we'll just go ahead and close the terminal for now while we have a brief look. Of course, any application that you have, there's nothing in here that's not on FlatHub. Of course, you can go in and you can add extra uh, FlatHub repositories if you want to. This should show. Here's your Fedora. Uh, here's your FlatHub. Here's your OS tree packaging. So these are going to be a little bit different than uh, than your typical Fedora uh, in that this is the that uh, silver blue core. And then here's FlatHub. If I wanted to add other other flat pack repositories, I could do that as well. But if we were to look for something like LibreOffice, for example, then you'll notice that the only option we have is flat packs. Um, oh, come on. I wanted to look at that information. Don't give me. <sighs> Sometimes this stuff has a mind of its own. All right. So here you can see you have the. Okay, if you saw briefly before the things trying to decide to do the application data, you had two options here. You have one from the flat uh, repository, the Fedora repository, which is a flat pack. And then you have the one from uh, from FlatHub. So you have both of those as options, but everything installing is flat pack. So that is basically the way it works. And if you're familiar with how this is working, it's basically the same thing that uh, you'd see if uh, I just hand this to you and you're a basic user. You may not know it's not a standard Fedora. But let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to show you the uh, toolbox. So if you do toolbox enter, uh, then what you're going to do is this is going to go into the toolbox I created. Now, first you have to do a toolbox create. You can give it a name. So you can give it like toolbox, you know, Bob, and then enter toolbox Bob. Uh, so in this case here, uh, let me actually exit out of here. So what I actually did is just for a fun testing, I installed LibreOffice under the toolbox. So you see if I uh, just type in LibreOffice, I get nothing. But if I do my toolbox enter, and then this gives me now, you'll notice the uh, purple dot in there that we are inside of the toolbox. Now, if I do LibreOffice, you'll actually see um, it will load LibreOffice. If I go and open up files, here's actually a document that I created. So LibreOffice is running from the terminal in the toolbox. Now, of course, if you wanted to install LibreOffice, just install the flat pack, obviously. Uh, but I did want to do this just to kind of show you how this kind of stuff works. 
So uh, that is how the toolbox works. You can run in there, usually use it for command line stuff, and then anything you do in the command line stays in the command line. Uh, so hit exit, and then that gets you out of the toolbox. Hit exit again, it's going to close you out of your terminal. Now, as far as the system is otherwise concerned, you can still go ahead and uh, do changes, for example, to your host file. So this is something like NixOS does not allow you to do. Uh, so let's just do 127.0.0.1, do google.com, and I don't remember if they use www or not, so let's go ahead and add that one as well. Okay, ex um, exit out of there. Save that. And if I now pull up Firefox and go to google.com, then uh, it should not work unless it makes a liar out of me. So you see Google is not working. So despite it being an immutable system, I still do have the option to uh, get in here and make these simple changes inside the host file. Let me go ahead and kill these guys. And try that again. And so now we can get to google.com. So while it is an immutable system, you can still do simple things like making adjustments to your host file and other stuff like that to make the system actually good and functional and, and usable. So overall, um, you're going to get a little bit more security. You're going to get a little bit more containerization. It's not as easy to use this as it is going to be using some of your other tools that are out there. But the bottom line is if you do need a good containerized uh, deployment or some other system that's going to make Fedora or any of these other um, immutable operating systems work better for you. You know, these are a good, good option to have. This might very well be a sort of future of operating systems. It kind of does convert computers into the same type of containerization that we find inside of something like a smartphone where the core OS is over here and all your applications are, are APK files or whatever. Apple does, and uh, keeping all of those different separate, isolated, and containerized. So this basically is making operating systems the same thing. Some of these, like this one here, Fedora Silverblue, I could use this long term. I've been trying to mess around with Nix OS on a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> it's too many problems for me. Um, but I do like the way they're doing it. I like the implementation. Uh, I'm still not sure if I'm a, a complete immutable system guy or not, but it is kind of neat to see how these are evolving, how they're adding layers, how they're adding security, how they're adding image base and containerized bases to all these different functions and, and uh, how we're doing things. So uh, with that, let me know what you think about these immutable operating systems in general. Which other immutable systems should I look at? Let me know in the comments down below. And hey, maybe by the end of the year, we'll have a video out on the various different combined immutable systems that are available. With that, thank you for watching, everybody. And I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy... Switching to Linux.